So I tend to do a lot of typing on screen rather than just show PowerPoints. Because just looking at PowerPoint, your eyes start to roll up and then you grab your phone, you know, and you start watching Twitch, or whatever. So uh, it's a little bit more interesting to watch me typing, maybe, than just look at PowerPoints. It's even more interesting when you're typing along. So we're going to be uh, doing programming together. You have the option of not doing the program. You don't have to type along. Um, some people don't learn, you know, from typing. Um, some people do. Give it a try. And if it doesn't feel right to you, then switch over to just saying, okay, you know, I'm going to take some written notes or whatever. But I do want you to upload a note at the end of each class because what I'm going to do is every class period, there's going to be a daily assignment folder, which I don't see here. It'll be very, you're very soon. Where you can upload what you type that day. And it's not the daily notes. That's where the file that I put that covers the day is going to be. It'll make sense really soon. We'll do this together. The idea is, is that I'm going to be writing programs up here to demonstrate stuff, loops and whatever, you know, drawing things on the screen. And you can type along so that you can get the loops to run and you can draw the things on the screen at the same time, you know. And I'll take stops periodically because people inevitably get what are known as syntax errors, which are, you know, typos and mistakes in the grammar and stuff like that. The program won't work. I'll wander around, you know, and that takes a little bit of time. But I think a lot of people learn better by actually having the program running in front of them, getting to type it in. It starts to sink in. You have all of your own notes. You can save your program. You can look, you know, look at it later in order to do your homework. Quite often, the homework assignment is based very closely on what we did in class. So, for example, before we even talk about the syllabus or whatever, we're going to write a program. So, what I want you to do is the program we use is known as Python. Excuse me, the programming language. And this isn't a class just about a programming language. It's to learn programming logic, which means that we're going to use a textbook that's about logic and not just the Python language. As a matter of fact, the textbook is not specific to Python. And even more so, until this last revision, it didn't even have any Python in it. So is it a good Python textbook? No, it's not a good Python textbook. So we're going to be using other resources to fill in the gaps there. Don't panic about that. Um, another point is sometimes people wonder, why am I taking Python? Because I always hear about you know people programming in uh, you know, JavaScript or C++ or something like that. Python is a very commonly used language out in the industry, actually. It's not a toy language. Back in the old days, uh, you might go to college and you might learn a language like Pascal, which you would never see again, you know, when you went out, you know, into the real world. Well, that's not true. Python is very commonly used. And the other good thing about Python is that it's easier to get into and to write code in than it is with some other programming languages where you have to kind of construct a framework first. I could show you a Java program, the very minimum, just to print a message on the screen and the steps you have to go to. And then I can show you the same in Python. And you go, yeah, that Python looks pretty cool. So there are multiple ways of running Python programs. Who uses a Mac here? No Mac users? All right. I'll make things a little bit easier. You want to get on our laptops? Oh, you can do your stuff on your laptop, absolutely. But if you don't have Python installed in your laptop just for this first day, go ahead and use the school computer or just watch, right? One or the other. But I'd like for you to type along. Mac has Python installed on it, and the operating system uses it, but it has the uh, version 2 installed. And since about, you know, for the past 10 years, version 3 has been the primary version, they're not, you know, quite compatible. So I don't know why Apple hasn't updated it. So you have to install version 3 on top of version 3. Uh, to, it, it's not nearly as complex on Windows where you just download something and, and you get it to run. So to run Python, one way to do it is if you have it installed on your local computer, just go to the search box or, you know, whatever. Type on, type in idle. Yeah, you could type in Python as well. If you just type in Python and don't necessarily do this, you don't really get anything that you could write a program in. Okay, that's not true. It launched idle. That's pretty cool. What is idle? Idle is an editor. It's what's known as an IDE. Let me start taking my notes here. So, we use Python. 
we use an IDE, which is known as an integrate. Uh, you don't have to type in these notes. I always upload these, but you know, if it helps, you, you know, burn things in your brain. Integrated development environment. I did start the recorder, did I not? We do have audio, do we not? All right, everything's going great. What does integrated development environment mean? It means that it comes with an editor where you can type in your program, and then it comes with a way to compile and run the program all in one batch. Back in the old, 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 bad old days, you would write your program with, you know, with one thing, and then you'd go back to the, what's known as the command prompt, and you'd compile it and you'd run it. A lot easier nowadays for most environments. Idle is is the IDE we use. Kind of cute. IDE. IDLE. The guy who invented Python was nuts about, I guess he still is, hopefully, about Monty Python's Flying Circus. If you know anything about Monty Python, Eric Idle is one of the primary members. I guess, uh, you know, it's pure circumstance that it wasn't called Cleese for John Cleese rather than Idle, except, you know, the matching letters. So anyways, I want to launch Idle. And I did not realize that, uh, and it's, I don't think it's true for everybody, that if you launch Python from here, it actually launches idle. I don't trust that. I don't know if that's true for everybody. So I'm just going to type in idle, and it's going to pop up the idle program. All right, that's one way. If you're at a machine that does not have Python on it, then you can also find online versions of Python. I've been on, online by on. You can probably pretty much just click on any of these. Now we might settle on a specific one, right? But if you click that, again, you get a little editor where we can start typing stuff, and then we can run the program. Yeah, we're going to use Idle in here. It's already installed on it. Is it the only development environment you can install? No, there are lots of others. If we type in something like install Python, uh, well, you know, Python editor. If we type in Python editor into Google, we'll see um, other ones. Something called Real Python. Uh, there's one called PyCharm. There's all sorts of them, and they all have their strengths. PyCharm, I believe, is installed on these machines. We launch it and I'm showing you lots of options just to, you know, for it to kind of gel and then we're going to kind of ignore them. But if you feel like exploring them, the more you explore, the better programmer you become, right? Just like if you're going to be a gamer, if you only played one game, you're not going to be very good when you move on to the next game, right? Um, you know, the more games you get, the, the more the logic gels until you, you know, you, you pretty much know what kind of thing you're going to do when you sit down and play an RPG or something like that. So I, I try to give you background knowledge. So we're not going to use an online one. Maybe we'll do that, you know, just to switch. I recommend, strongly, strongly recommend that you install Idle on your home computer or your laptop. If you have a laptop and you feel like bringing it to class and typing along, that is awesome. Why is it awesome? Because everything you need, you know, you go home, you already have everything set up. You can just do your homework, you know, in the same environment that we learned at school. That's cool. Of course, if you don't like bringing your laptop around and have a big old Alienware, you know, that's, you know, this tone or uh, whatever. Yeah, you can figure that out. Where was I going with that? If you don't install Idle on your laptop, you can still do your homework, right, just by using one of these online editors. It's much more convenient to do it in Sutton. Well, maybe I won't say Maybe convenient is not the right word because, wow, that looks pretty convenient. It's right there. Right. But it doesn't save your work. It makes it harder to submit your work. Just a really good idea to have the environment on your local machine. You can't install new add-ons to make Python behave differently if you're doing it online. Strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you go ahead and install it. And uh, and we'll make a little detailed list of the things that I want you all to do for the class. It's not like you just have to remember off the top of your head. So, close the online. Load up Python shell. Or load up idle. You know, search bar idle. It comes up with what's known as the shell. What is a shell? 
I don't know if any of y'all are old enough to have ever used DOS programs, right? You're going to play Wing Commander or something like that. DOS looks something like this, right? This is what people did in the, you know, in the 80s, you know, up to the 90s until people switched over to using Windows. And it's just an environment where you type in commands and you can run programs. Well, when you run Python, it does the same thing. It launches a command prompt. But it's a Python specific one where you can write Python programs and you can run Python commands. That's what this is. I can execute Python commands. So when we launch idle, we get the shell. You might be able to configure idle so it goes straight into a programming window rather than the shell. But basically our program is divided into two parts. There's the shell and then there's the editor. What is the shell for? It's for entering commands and just seeing what happens immediately. It's the difference between um, telling somebody what to do. You know, I point at you and I say, I want you to step forward three feet. You know, I want you to pick up the computer. I want you to push it off the desk right now. Not a good idea, but I'd be giving you commands. Or you can write a program. What is a program? It's a series of instructions. It's a series of commands. So instead of me telling you to stand up, push a computer off the desk, I give you a piece of paper that has all those instructions on them. Right. So that's what the shell is, is you enter commands into it. And it runs them right away. It runs them on the spot. Interactive. And then the editor is where you enter a series of commands and save it as a file. You're going, why aren't you talking about the syllabus? Because syllabuses are boring and we're going to be here for a while, so let's do some fun stuff first. So save it as a file and then run that file. That's a program. A program is just a series of instructions stored in a file. So when you save it as a file, that's called the source code, also called the program, also called the script. Why do we have to have several different terms for everything? Well, just because there's always more than one way of looking at things, and programming's been around since the 40s, and each time somebody invents something new, they call it something else, and if they, if it, you know, catches on. So anyways. So we will be writing programs, which we can nickname scripts. The programs are our source code, and then we run that file. Well, let's do that. Well, first, let's <laughs> check out the shell. I said that when we launch idle, we get the shell. All right, I'm going to enter a command. A equals 3. Print parentheses A. It did it right off the spot, right? There. I've done it. I've done something in, in Python. I made it do something. Yes, sir. You had a question. I just heard uh, Pardon me? I just said, uh, okay. oh, okay. Got it, got it, got it. Sorry. Okay. So, right, we could write a program as complex or as simple as we wanted to right here in the shell, except it's not really a program. It's just a series of commands. I'm telling it what to do on the spot. B equals A plus 2, right? It's kind of just like little algebraic equations. If A is equal to 3, then what's B going to equal after it executes that command? It's going to equal 5. So I can print parentheses B, 5. Right? Now what if I decided that originally A was supposed to equal 7, and I wanted to do these steps again? Well, in the perfect world, I could come up here and I could change that to a 7. And, well, it didn't let me change it. Right. That's the problem with the shell, is that it's only doing one thing at a time. You can't go back and revise it. Right. Just like after I told you to stand up and push your computer on the floor. What if I changed my mind and you were just supposed to move it to another desk? Right. Too bad. You've already, you know, picked it up and pushed it on the floor. There's no recourse. That's why we write programs where we could put all of these commands into a program. And we're going to do that now. File, new file, 
I recommend that the very first thing you do is you save your program. And there's a very, very bad place to save it, and you have to pick your good place to save it. What do I mean by that? If I just choose File, Save As, if you look at the path, it saves it in some operating system, Python 37 directory. That shouldn't be there. Somebody managed to save something into the root directory here, right? Um, I have multiple people sharing this computer. It wasn't supposed to do that. They weren't supposed to save anything there. Um, I'm going to have to leave a note on the desk saying do not leave, store your programs. Why? Because this is the guts of the program, right? It's like you've installed Call of Duty on your on your home computer, and then you decide to start saving your Word documents into you know the Call of Duty directory. They're not really a good idea. Might work for a while. You might break the program, and when I say break it, you might really, really, really break it to the point where Python won't even run just because you saved the file with it as directory. This directory actually should be read only, except then we would not be able to install, you know, plugins to make it work differently. Never install anything into the directory. This is Python 37. If you do it by accident, then it's not probably going to break your program, your your Python install, but it's risky. So instead, you're going to want to make a directory somewhere to save your stuff. I don't care if you bring a flash drive. I love flash drives. I, uh, I love them so much that I lose them within a week of buying one. Let's uh, come up here and I'm going to make a new folder. These are last year's, last semester's classes, so I'm getting rid of them all. Alright, so what I did, and it irks me that uh, now that they've reinstalled, you know, got new computers with Windows 10, I'm not able to, you know, make links to my folders over here. So just to make it easy to find, I'm going to stick my new folder off the desktop. So when I did file save as, and then I choose desktop, I want a new folder. Just call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it the name of the class. You feel like calling it, you know, programming or Python or whatever. I don't care. If you like putting your name in that directory, go for it. There we're good to go. I have a directory and I need to write a program. I need to give it a name. I don't care how you label your things. You just kind of want to make them easy to find. You could call it June 3. I'm going to label my programs consecutively day by day, right? First day is day A, the second day is day B, the third day is day C and so on. You know, and since we have, you know, about 15 class sessions, is that right? We're meeting uh, two times a week for eight weeks. Anyways, but we get a holiday maybe. So anyways, you know, we might go through A through T or whatever, 15 minutes. Lecture A is what I'm going to call mine. You might be tempted to make it say lecture space A. Uh, program source codes should not have spaces in them. Again, it probably won't break your program. In some languages, you cannot create program file names with spaces in them. Kind of old school. Kind of spaces. You can always use an underscore. Anyways, I'm just going to call mine lecture A. I'm not going to give it any additional information. If you like tacking your name onto it, whatever, you know, lecture A. All right. Now, what did my program do? I think it started off with A equals 3. I think I made a capital A here, and in my script, I may have made it a lowercase a. Doesn't really matter as long as I don't mix them up. And what do I mean by that? Don't type this. I'm temporarily going to go back to the shell, and I'm going to say C is equal to A plus 3. Right? Z is equal to A plus 3. Whoops. Whoops. Totally messing that up. There we go. Boom. Syntax error. A is not defined. Well, that's because it was called lowercase a. Right? Those are two different things. Right? They look the same, but they're not. This gives us what's known as a syntax error. Calls it a name error, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds of syntax error. Z is equal to A. And like I said, don't be typing this unless you just really feel like it. Certainly don't be typing it in your program. Oh, well, that actually worked. I'm surprised that that worked. I was trying to come up with a syntax error. There. Right. Okay. 
So there's all sorts of syntax errors. It's just a mistake in the grammar or a typo. This was a typo using an uppercase A when I originally defined this variable as a lowercase A. This is a syntax error because it's bad grammar, bad programming grammar. Be like saying, I ain't going to, right? There's all sorts of things wrong with that sentence. Maybe you understand what I ain't going to means, right? By context, you may understand that, you know, I'm saying that I'm not going to do whatever because we were just talking about going to the store. But, you know, it's bad grammar. Just like this, A, we're not telling it what to add to A. Oh, well, it's, it's bad, right? It's a mistake. I'm going to go back over here. And maybe since I had these uppercase letters in my shell, I'm going to change that one there. And then I'm going to say print parentheses A, just like my the first four lines of code. It's cold. I wish I brought a jacket. Then B equals A plus 2. Print parentheses B. I try to make it easy for you all to type along. I try to say all the parentheses and stuff like that. At a certain point, I'm going to expect you to know that when I say print, you're supposed to add the parentheses. So when I say print, print, or when I say print B, at that point, you're supposed to just type in print parentheses B, right? Hopefully, I narrate it close enough that you don't have to be staring at this. Not all of us are touch typists, right? And I try to go slowly enough so that everybody can keep up. If I'm going too fast, slow me down. You know, because I can type, you know, 120 words a minute. I just try not to because not everybody can. Okay. I'm ready to run my program. Now, quite often, I save my program without even mentioning it. I just hit Control-S to save my program. I do it out of habit. Not to be sneaky, right? But I can hit Control-S. It saves the program, and I'm ready to run it. How do I know that it's saved or not? If I make a change... There's an asterisk up here that indicates that it's a not saved program. Is that a big deal? Not really, because when I choose to run it, if it hasn't been saved, it will ask me on the spot. So how do I run my program? I choose run from the menu, run module. Source must be saved, okay? Yeah, but if I had done a control S beforehand, I wouldn't have had to do that. Run, run module. And there, it ran it inside the shell, right? We still see all this old stuff, but we see our new program here. But you see the difference, right? You see that here I wrote a program. Here I just gave some instructions. A program is a series of instructions. We did everything the same, right? The first, first four commands are the same, but the advantage here is that I can change something. I can say A is equal to 4, and I can rerun it. I couldn't do that here. I couldn't edit the prior instructions up here. And I could email you this, right? I could put it on a flash drive and copy it onto a different computer, right? I couldn't do all that. OK, now, almost every class, for the first few classes, whenever I sit up here and I start typing in code, people start typing it into the shell. This doesn't work. We're not going to hardly ever do anything in the shell. Just by habit. As soon as you load up idle, just click File New. Just out of habit, right? Because you're going to run into a situation where we're trying to go and edit things, like, you know, we want to change the print statement or something like that, and we can't, right? Because this is not an editor. We can't go and fix the prior thing. Quite often, I'm just going to close the shell. I may close the shell every time I run something. Why? Because it's got all this messy stuff. If I close my shell, easy to know which one, it's just called shell. Then if I run my program again, run module, there, right? Nice, fresh, and clean. I like doing that. I will do that by habit. I may not remember to do it every time, but but yeah, you know, I almost wish that uh, it would close that automatically. But I guess there's you know useful information to be seen. You know sometimes I want to make sure that everybody's got idle up and running, at least everybody who's trying to. 
that everybody's got a program written and that everybody can run it. So I'm going to pause the recording and do some walking about to make sure that that's the case. All right, that's a really boring program. We're going to make it a little, little, little bit better. And then we're going to go and do the syllabus. All right, let's make it a little bit better. First thing we're going to do is we're going to add some information to the program so that if we ever open it up again, we know what we're looking at. This is what's known as a comment block. And I want you to add one of these to the very top of all of the code that you do. If I get, you know, I may make it a hard and fast rule that you don't get any credit for homework if you don't put this kind of stuff up at the top. So I'm going to put that this is lecture A. You know, if it's a homework assignment, homework 7, you could do that there. I'm going to put my name, right? You could put something else useful if you wanted to, like the name of the class, you know. And then you could put a description of it, right? What are we doing? Well, I don't know what we're doing yet, so I'm not going to put a description. But, you know, I did put what it was, you know, who I am, why I did it. I could even put the date. That's useful information. This is known as a comment block. It's so that the next time you open the file, you know what you did, right? You know what you're looking at. The more information up there, the better, right? When we're just writing these 10 line programs, you know, and these 20 line programs in class or whatever, uh, you know, we don't need as much documentation. It's called documentation. Adding comments, these are known as comments, they all begin with this symbol. It tells the Python language to ignore this stuff when I'm ready to run it. Right? It didn't print out Lecture A Jeff Thompson, it still just did the same thing that it did before. You can put anything you want to in the comments, right? You can print, you know, I really hate Python, and it's not going to hurt its feelings, right? Or you can put new lines of code in here, but if they're commented out, right, print what, right? It's not going to print what, because it's commented out, right? It's a comment. I'm going to delete that. That's stupid. But I'm going to prove it first. I'm going to run it. And we will see that it, in fact, does not print what? Because that line of code, it's in there, but it's just a comment, right? It doesn't have to follow any syntax. I could write that comment, you know, in, you know, in Farsi, you know, if I'm from Persia or whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. Now, these things need to be written in the specific language that we're learning. And since it was invented by someone who spoke English, they made the commands English. And that's the way that a lot of programming languages are, right? You know, English is kind of the general, you know, universal language of programming. It doesn't have to be that way anymore, but, you know, can you imagine sitting down and having to learn, you know, the, uh, the Japanese word for print, you know, as part of your programming language and all the English words, all the verbs that we see in our programs, you know, instead we had to learn another language. So imagine growing up in, a, you know, in another country where you didn't know English and you were learning programming. There'd be that a little bit of additional challenge. All right. Now, I don't really hate Python. I'm going to delete that comment. I love Python. I'm going to delete that comment, too. That stuff is not necessary. But along with the comment block up at the top, it's a good idea to add comments to your code saying what it's doing. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, it's a little bit too much. Don't type this because I'm going to undo it. To go and add a comment, you know, set A equal to 4. Right, and then, you know, print, you know, right. You know, I could describe every line of code, but I'm not going to do that. But I might add comments, which are kind of like, you know, chapter headers, you know, or titles or whatever, you know, demonstrate, you know, assignments and output, parentheses print, right? That, that's what that is demonstrating. That's why I left that there. If I ever go back and open this program, I'm going to know why I had that code there. Gonna run it one more time to make sure I didn't break it. Why do I say that? Could adding comments break your code? 
you said you could type anything you wanted to up there. Well, you could kind of break it. And the reason I say that is that there's a different form of comment. These are what are known as single line comments, right? Each one is its own line, right? I could put a comment here, and you know, it's just a single line. But if you want, you can put multiple lines of comments using quote, quote, quote. And I'm going to demonstrate it, and then I'll probably, yeah, I guess I don't have to delete it. But uh, here's what a multi-line comment looks like. It starts with triple quotes. Right. There. It's a multi-line comment. Why? It just spans multiple lines. Right? But if I had, whoopsie. By the way, Control Z undoes. Control Z will be your best friend, or you can always hit Edit Undo, because I made some an, a mistake. All right, now it's still gonna run, but I can goof that up to where it no longer runs. What do I mean by that? What if I'd forgotten that it takes three quotes to close my comment? Now all of a sudden, this stuff is green. It's not gonna be run. So we're going to see that it, boom. So I added a multi-line comment, but I broke the syntax of it. I did not put the triple quotes there. Why does it have to have the triple quotes? Because otherwise, how does it know when the comment ends? Right. So this is an example of a multi-line comment. I'm going to add that to my code just to let myself know. So we are now programmers. We know how to write code. There's a little bit more to it than that. But we're off to a good start. Now, if I was going to write this in the Java programming language, I would launch what's known as NetBeans. I would have to create a new file. I would have to create what's known as a class. A class is something that's already got like 10 or 20 lines of code in it before it even lets me type in stuff that does A is equal to 4 and print A, right? So Java is a common beginner programming language, but it's not a beginner language. Neither is this really, but it's so much easier to get something, to go from nothing to something in this programming language than it is in some others like C++ and Java. All righty. I'm going to close this for now. Looks like I'm missing some stuff up at the top of this. Maybe I'll miss it. Using your hashtags and your triple quotations for your comment blocks, is that something that just Python does? Or is that you are correct. You are correct. That is Python specific. Yeah, the question is, is uh, are the hashtags and the triple quotes just something for Python? In some languages, a lot of languages, you start, don't type this because it's not correct for this language. You start your comments like that. This is a C style comment. Also used in Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, a whole bunch of other languages use that. That's a single line comment in that language. A I don't know what the comment in MATLAB is. We could look it up. I would just go to Google and type in, you know, MATLAB it's comment. A single quotation, but I was curious as to what kind of program specifically that type of sort was. Yeah, I am not sure. I am not sure if it follows another language or if it's its own language. Like a lot of, uh, nah, anyways. And then this is a multi line comment in those languages, right? not the same for this language. The inventor of Python could just as easily have chosen slash slash to be a comment, but instead he made slash slash do something else, which we will learn that those other languages don't do. Okay, so fun time's over. We're going to go back and we're going to talk about the syllabus. What am I talking about? This is even more fun than programming. I love talking about syllabuses. When I launch Canvas, it says syllabus.
down at the bottom. I wish it didn't say that, but if you click on that so-called syllabus, it shows you some uh, <coughs> due dates. Right. <clears throat> That's what it's for. It's a task list. Ought to be called task list. That's not where our syllabus is. Our syllabus is going to be over here in modules. Now I could probably, since I become a guru in Canvas, I know that I could push this up like to the top of the thing here. Maybe I'll do that, but if I start messing with this and customizing it, it's going to look different from your other classes, so maybe I ought to just do them. Anyways, that's where our syllabus is. is. When I launched Canvas and I found our class, I clicked modules, right, access denied. Oh, I'm in student view. That's why. Right, so when I click the Raider symbol and I go into, you know, my class, we can change the picture, I believe. I'm going to try to put something a little bit more interesting than just the color gray there. I'm going to go back into student mode so it looks just for me like it does for you. Why am I not seeing it? Student view, right there. No, not new announcement. Student view, just for me. Modules, syllabus. Now the Canvas preview mode seems to be a little bit more accurate than the <coughs> D2L preview mode. But still, as a matter of course, I'm always going to recommend downloading a file. But you're only going to look at this once or twice. You don't have to download it. When we start looking at PowerPoints, strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you download it and view it using a PowerPoint application. If you don't have PowerPoint installed, on the other hand, then maybe doing it in the viewer there is, you know, is an ideal thing to do. So, I like downloading things. I'm not going to do it for this one. If I wanted to, I could click on the file name. I could go and I could save it into my programming directory. Load it up. All right. And yeah, I should have saved it as a PDF, but I didn't. Almost everything can be a Word document anymore anyways. Your phones can, so, you know, whatever. All right. Here's our class. 1113, our section number. Hope that's right. Fundamentals of Programming Spring. What are we going to be doing? Yeah, it looks like this uh, doesn't like the fact that I had an extra space there. Introductory course to develop both procedural and oriented, object-oriented logic. Okay, well that's all, you know, all Greek to us, whatever procedural and object-oriented is. Those are very important terms. Right now, all we care about the fact is that we are learning logic for pro problem solving utilizing several programming development tools and techniques including flowcharts, pseudocode, and a programming language. Now these are all three very different things. I pity the people who are watching me at this at home, well I guess I could Google it up. But a flowchart is just a series of symbols with some writing in the blocks. Right. It's not a program. You draw a flowchart and it doesn't do anything. Right. It's just to look at. It's like drawing, you know, a little hand map, right? You know, and just pictures on it and stuff like that. It, it doesn't actually do anything, but it's useful for outlining the logic. And then there's pseudocode. What is pseudocode? Pseudocode is just a loosey-goosey written description. Like, if I go back to my notes file, which I've neglected for a while, you know, set A to 3. Then print, you know, A. You know, add, wait, set B equal to, you know, A plus 2. Finally, output B. Right, you know, that's pseudocode. We ought, we're going to make it a little bit more formal than that. But this isn't a programming language, right? It's just a, uh, a series of steps. Like, if you're telling somebody how to bake a cake, you might just tell them, you know, add the sugar, add the flour, add the eggs, and bake it. Right. Well, that does not tell you how to bake the cake. 
right? That's the pseudocode version of it. You could give some very detailed, you know, descriptions. You open up, you know, Betty Crocker, and you know, it tells you, you know, how much sugar, how much this, how much you have to add, and even then. That would not tell a machine, right? The factory, you know, the hostess cake factory, whatever, would not be enough to tell them that. They have to, you know, program their machine with incredibly detailed instructions on how to make the cake, right? This is just pseudocode, right? That is pseudocode. Now, I can't help it. I still make my comments like that, even if it's pseudocode. And then this is source code. I'm just going to copy and paste it out of my notes. You don't have to type it. But I'm, I mean, out of my idle file, out of my Python file. But I'm going to remove the comments from the middle of it just because I want to see the difference, right? There. We see the difference, right? This is all loosey-goosey. It's going to kind of follow a syntax, but it's not a specific syntax. And if you make an, a syntax error in it, well, it doesn't matter because it's not trying. we're not trying to run it. So that's the difference between pseudocode and source code, or a program, which Python calls a script. I'll kind of flip between those interchangeably, but I think I'm ultimately going to just settle for calling it program, right? Because we're writing a program. Let's go back to our syllabus. We will learn a programming language. We know which one. Present the core concepts of, y'all can't read this, this is itty bitty little print. Well, maybe you can. Core concepts, variables, decisions, loops, functions, and objects. All of this stuff is common to every programming language. Using MATLAB, you're going to have the ability to do all of this, I bet. You're writing JavaScript or C, you know, whatever. They're all going to have the ability to create variables, do decisions, do loops, write and call functions. So we're getting a good programming education by learning this language that you will then immediately be able to turn around and apply to the next programming language you learn, if you learn one. And generally, I always say learning one programming language is good. Learning two programming languages is great. Learning three programming languages is incredible. And after that, you can pick up any programming language within days. Uh, that, that, that's probably an overstatement. But the concepts are so similar that once you get the hang of the concepts and the way to implement it in one or two different languages, or, you know, in, in two languages or so, then it's real easy to pick up a third one. Kind of like, you know, those romance languages where they're, they're similar to each other. Like, I believe Portuguese is close to Italian. And if you know Italian, then you already know half of Portuguese or something like that. Now, I may be totally wrong because I don't know either one of them, you know, but even, you know, a, a lot of those languages have some similarities. And then there's English. This course will present that it's designed to assume no programming experience. If you know programming, if you took four years of job in high school, that's pretty awesome. Um, could be that you're going to be bored some of the time, but I'm going to try to make it interesting anyways. Now, if you've had four years of Python programming in high school, <laughs> anyways, use to implement the core concepts. All right. By the way, that's my name. I'm a professor. I have an office downstairs near the uh, end of the hallway. During the summer, my office hours, I will, I will be in my office sometimes, especially on these days, you know, that our class meets because like, you know, I have this class and then I have evening classes and so what am I going to do, right, you know, am I going to go to the swimming pool or am I going to stay here and work, I'll probably have office hours, but really they need to be a, by appointment only and actually should have said that. I hope this is not the wrong version of the, uh, because I pretty much remember typing that. All right, well I guess we'll find out if this is the wrong version. This is my phone number. Here's what I would ask you all to do. Even if you haven't been typing in any code, whip out your communication technology of choice, your watch, your microwave oven, your phone, and send me a text message, please. Text me at, and if you need the area code, it is 405, of course, 898-7767. Add me as a contact, right? And give me the class name, and your name, right? This is CIT 1113. 
and your name is Edgar Poe. No, I'm kidding. Don't put Edgar Poe. But I swear that I don't know if people like uh, are are joking or not. But if I just put your name up there, then somebody's going to send me a text message that says your name, right? I ought to put Tony Stark or something. You know, make absolutely sure people know that I want your name, not you know. So, anyways, and then why are you sending me this text message? Because it's a great way to communicate with me. If you, uh, oh, somebody did it. I got a ding. I, I hope to hear about 10 dings before we're done. If you're programming, you're stuck, you just take a picture of your code, you text it to me, I'll probably within seconds be able to tell you what's wrong with it. Now, of course, you know if I'm driving or if I'm in another class, it's going to be delayed, right? But it's a really good way of interacting, right? Because otherwise, we're gonna, what are you going to do? Well, I got a syntax error. You know, you, you call me on the phone. I'm not going to be able to help you. Uh, I'll say email me the code. No, I'm not going to ask you to email me the code because then I have to go and check. You know, if if you can take a picture and send it to me, then we can work much faster, right? I can just circle the line that's wrong and send it back to you, or I can say, okay, change that print statement to say blah blah blah. Yeah, really good. And don't be shy about texting me. Some people, you know, uh, some students are shy about contacting the professor. Please don't be shy. I'm begging you to contact me. And I don't care if it's day or night. I stay up until 2 a.m. every night. So, you know, feel free to text me late at night. And I also know how to mute my phone and my iPad. So never feel shy about texting me. It's possible that I'm going to say that what we're talking about is too complex to handle over text. But most, most of the time, it's not. All right, did I really only hear two games? I hope I'm not getting more than two messages. Don't make me stop this car. All right. All right, I got four. Come on, guys. Show me some love. All right, five. We'll go. You know, just because you didn't do it now doesn't mean you can't do it later. The other reason that I like to have people's text messages, uh, numbers, is so I can communicate with you real fast. Why would I do that? I see there's a, there's a tornado warning, right? I don't want y'all to come to class that day. I'll blast out a message, assuming that I'm not caught in the tornado, right? Or if I'm sick, right? I have a tire blowout on the way here. I can text y'all, right? Rather than just email and hope that y'all know. Okay, so two-way communication is good. All right. Just putting that in the notes. All right, back to the syllabus. Of course, I do have an email. Everybody here has a raider.rose.edu email address. So if you slip up and put raider. in there, it's still going to get to me. I have my Gmail address configured to forward to me. So no sweat, but that's the official one. All right. We all know what room we're supposed to be in. Delivery method, hybrid, lecture and online. What does that mean? Well, it means that we have Canvas and I can post instructions there, you know, and I can send you all email and, you know, and you're going to be submitting stuff like that. So it's not just come in and, you know, sit through a lecture. We use a program. We use an online thing as well. So you really do need a computer to do the assignments, right? Could you try to do the whole thing on your phone? Could you try to do the whole thing on your on your tablet or your iPad? No, I'm not talking about something like a Microsoft Surface or some awesome convertible like that. I've had people try to do this class on a Chrome Chromebook, something like that. It didn't really work out too well for them, but they were able to do it, you know, for the most part. Really, you need a computer. And yeah, these other devices are computers, but all of us have computers because otherwise, how would we play our awesome games? If you don't have a computer, there's a computer lab right over there with idle installed on it, right next door to us. So you can pop in there and do your homework if you need to. Or, you know, go over and harass your friend, borrow their computer, install stuff on it. They'll love you. Recommend you use Windows, Mac, or Linux, but if you're a guru in some other thing, are there any other things besides Chromebooks? I don't know. I will videotape. I will. I love that term, videotape. Do we use tape anymore? Nah. Anyways, I will record lecture videos. I will post them to YouTube. We'll have a playlist. So if you miss a day, you're going to be able to go and review it. We'll talk more about that later. 
All right, textbooks. We need that book. Anyways, we'll go more into that. I'm not requiring y'all to have the textbook now, but certainly by next week you better have it because we'll be doing the, you know, the stuff there. I really like physical text text to read. If I was taking a course and I had the option, I would probably buy physical text. Now, on the other hand, I like Kindle books as well. So, but you know, with this one, you do get an online version. Yes. Uh -huh. Hundreds, thousands. No, I'm kidding. How many quizzes are there? Well, we're probably going to get through about seven chapters, and so there's going to be about seven quizzes, and then there's going to be two exams, kind of a midterm and then a final. Now, the quizzes, don't stress over them because you get to take them until you make 100, right? I let you retake it over and over and over. It grades it automatically. You know immediately what you got, and then you can take it again. And then you can take it again, right? So it's almost free points, right? Just for sitting down and taking it a couple of times, you're going to get a good grade on all your quizzes, which is good news because that gets them, you know, wrapped up into your total exam score for the class, right? So it's pretty awesome. The exams have some questions that are taken exactly from the quizzes. So doing the quizzes is great. And the one way to review for the exams is just to, like, you know, Read through your quiz answers again, right? Or take it one more time. What could it hurt? You know, it doesn't record your latest score. It records the highest score. So even if you take it again and you're just, you know, intentionally answering them wrong to run through the quiz as fast as possible, it doesn't hurt you. All right. Then we're also going to be using this textbook, How to Think Like a Computer Scientist. And I don't use this one as much as I used to, but maybe I'm going to start doing it again. This text open book project for a while I just taught it using this right I didn't even use a mind tap or a textbook because it is a text it's a web page right chapter one this is Python specific strongly recommend you read this as well you'll be a Python guru by the time you go through this strongly recommend you use this we'll be using it in here Right, because the textbook, although it does cover Python, not Python specific, right? So there, we might learn some things by learning it. This it's always a good idea to have more than one resource. There will be a link to this. There's supposed to be a link inside Canvas where it said, uh, you know, modules, online books. I'll see if I can tack it on right over there. Not listing there for some reason. Neither C engage. I will add those by the end of the day so that we can access them. Once you purchase C engage unlimited or mind tap access or whatever, your instinct is to go and log into C engage and then try to figure out how to get to the class. And you may get to something that asks for a key. The professor is supposed to give you key. No. In this case, in this class, you're going to register for our specific class. You still have to, you know by going to, you know, Canvas and clicking on see engage And that creates it. That hooks it up. Just like you're asking about how you're going to be able to access the material, you know, once we do it. The first time you do it, that's how you're going to do it, is you're going to go into Canvas, then you're going to find the uh, see engage and you're going to click the link that takes you into it, and that configures everything, rather than being prompted for, like, a login key, which is what will happen if you try to get to it the first time for see engage Now... I'm just going to make some notes here that a lot of people have trouble with C-Engage because C-Engage requires cookies, requires pop-ups. Nine out of ten people have cookie blockers and pop-up blockers and stuff like that. When you're trying to register for C-Engage and you start getting errors, it's going to give you a complaint saying that it's the professor's fault. The instructor did not set up something correctly. It's lying. It's putting the blame on me. Needs cookies, needs pop-ups. So, when you're trying to set yourself up for this, if you start getting those error messages, try disabling your pop-up blocker, right? Um, try, you know, disabling your ad software, anti-ad software. But you can do that on a site-by-site -site basis, right? I use something called Ad Block. Can I talk? Ad Block Pro. 
canvas is not listed here, but it can be as something that I want to allow. Right, right now it's configured to block ads on canvas. Well, I don't want it to block ads on canvas. There aren't any ads on canvas, and it could just interfere with the functioning of the site. So I click that. Now I have a cookie blocker as well, right? And, you know, a URL filter. Well, I don't want to filter anything on Canvas, so I'm going to disable that as well. Technical name for that is whitelisting, right? Blacklisting is when you forbid something. Whitelisting, okay. So you're going to want to whitelist if you try to run it. Now, if you, if you click on the Canvas link and it works beautifully, you're not going to have to stress, right? If you just flat out cannot figure out how to get Canvas to work with your browser, just switch to another one. Try good old Microsoft IE. Right, you know, still comes with all the computers. It doesn't have mad blockers installed and stuff like that. And then see if you can register and get it to work that way. And then start going back to your favorite browser and getting it to work. Just make sure you can get it set up. I mean, we'll we'll work through all that at a certain prompt. I'm just warning you right now. That's why I took the time to do that. Is that C Engage requires cookies and requires pop-ups. Required software, Python 3, which you install from python.org. Real easy to install. You just go to your browser, go to python.org, or you could even just type in install into Google, Python 3, right? And it'll take you right there. But anyways, if you go to python.org, Click on download, download the latest version for Windows. Right, real easy to find. Download it, save it, run it. Now, if I try to do it on these machines, right, I don't have permissions to do that on a, on a school computer, so it's not going to work. That's how you're going to install it. Okay. So, upon successful completion of the course, the student should be able to understand fundamental concepts and general principles of programming. Again, we're going to see these terms, loops, decisions, states, input, output, and understand and create flowcharts and pseudocode, write and run Python script programs that perform tasks demonstrating the concepts of programming. You will have homework assignments where you create your own programs. You have to do homework in the class. You can't just come in and, and uh, you know show up for class and not pass the class. You have to do some homework as well. Grading scale is pretty boring. 90 is an A, 80 is a B, 70 is a C, and so on. A lot of people do not consider me a difficult grader, right? My goal is for you to uh, to make a good grade in the class, but you have to put some effort into it, right? But I try to be reasonable, right? If you're making an 89, I'm going to you know, round you up you know, to an A and stuff like that. So the way the class is broken up point-wise, so your programs are a third of your grade. Attending class and uploading the stuff that we type in, or even just a document that says you're here, I'd rather you type in the stuff as we type it, is worth another third of your grade. And then the quizzes and the exams. Now, I'm really sure that we have the wrong version of this, and I hope it is not incredibly botched, right? Quizzes plus two exams. I must not have uploaded it, and it's probably got 30 references to D2L where it needs to say Canvas. I will fix this and upload the corrected version, replace the word D2L with the word Canvas, right? Sorry about that. I really thought that it was here. All right. So you will use Canvas to upload the script or the flowchart or the pseudocode, and you will upload a screenshot. You only have to do this for your homework, not in the lectures. You don't have to take a screenshot. What's a screenshot? You probably know what a screenshot is. It's just a picture of what's happening on your screen. You don't have to whip out your phone and take a picture. It's easy to take a screenshot with your computer. I'm going to do that right now. I'm just going to hit the print screen button 
which is way up there above the NumLock key. You can find it on your laptop. Print screen, and then I'm going to open Paint or Word, and I'm going to paste, and boom, there's my screenshot. You save it, and you, up, you upload it. You've taken a screenshot. It's, it's not going to take you, you know, more than an additional 30 seconds to get that running, right, get that taken care of. You won't get a grade for your homework if you don't include a screenshot. But that's just for programs, right? You draw a flowchart, you don't need to take a screenshot of the flowchart, right? That is the same thing. But programs. Why do I want screenshots? To prove that it's your work, not anybody else's. You can go, well, yeah, I could use anyways. Don't cheat, guys. And to prove that your program ran, right? Because you can write something that doesn't run. Right, just because you type some lines of code in does not mean that it work that you have a program that works. Right, I've demonstrated syntax errors. Right, that's a syntax error. I run it, boom, it blows up. Yeah, you could take a screenshot of a non-functioning program, right? But you got to get your programs to work before you submit them. If you don't, you're not going to get full credit. In fact, the syllabus, I believe, says that you get absolutely no credit for something with a syntax error. Now, I may be a little bit more generous, but what if you get stuck? I can't get my program to run. Well, that's when you're going to be texting me and stuff like that. And I may, may just say, okay, go ahead and upload it in, you know, as is, and then we're going to keep working on it, right? Just so that you can meet, you know, the deadline for it, and then you can start, you know, adding things to it. But for the most part, you got to get your program running. And you got to submit a screenshot to get credit for it. Back to the syllabus. So using the Canvas Assignments link for our class, you're going to upload that stuff. And you must submit a screenshot for the program. Showing the program running. Don't just take a picture of the code. Do you have to take 20 screenshots showing you testing it 20 different times? No, just take one, you know, run the program, type in a couple of things, you know, a couple of, you know, your name and age or whatever it's asking for, take a picture. Grading policy, programming assignments must run in order to get any credit. If they have syntax errors and won't run, you'll only get one point out of 100 for the assignment. Partial credit may be awarded for assignments that do not meet full criteria. What does that mean? If I told you to write a program that set A you know, equal to number and then added 2 to the A, and you forgot to do this part, right? You only did the first part, well, maybe that's half credit, right? But there's some good news about getting partial credit. How could there be good news? The good news is, is that I almost, almost always allow you to revise your program and to submit it for a better grade. Just like those quizzes in can in uh, in D two uh, quizzes in C Engage and MindTap, I let you take them over and over and over. Same thing for your homework. You don't get it right, revise it, upload it again. All right. Unfortunately, that needs to go away. There's no more bonuses for getting your programming your homework done on time. Programming assignments are due one week from the day they are assigned. Right. So I'm never going to come in on Monday and say you have to do something by Wednesday. But it is going to be due, you know, Sunday night so that we can look at it Monday, right? So it's due a week from the day that it's assigned. Or if I assign it Wednesday, it's going to be due Wednesday, meaning, you know, midnight, you know, Tuesday. Note, you have to complete at least 50% of the programming assignments. What does that mean? Well, you saw up here that you could maybe do all your tutorials ace the exams, and then you'd have a 66%, and you, you might think you might make a D without doing any homework. Well, actually, you, you don't. Uh, you can't pass unless you do half your homework. If it gets close to the end of the semester and you realize you haven't done half your homework, well, you probably knew that all along. You probably knew that you weren't turning in your homework. So it should not be a surprise that your grade's not going to be going well. So why didn't you just make it so that programming homework was 50% of your grade? Because I like giving people credit for showing up and for typing the code in, right? 
I could just make it so that the score, you know, was only was half quizzes and exams and half homework. But I like giving y'all credit for the effort that you expend in this class of taking notes and uploading them. Kind of pads out your grade for one thing, right? Late assignments, 10% off per week. If you haven't done it within a month, no credit for it. Now, since this is only a two-month class, if you haven't done it in a month, you're really, really, really far behind on that programming assignment and, you know, towards the second half of the semester, that's not even possible anyways. The in-class stuff, the in-class lectures must also be completed within four weeks or no credit, but I don't count off on a per-week basis, right? If you have the flu for a solid week and you don't get around to watching the lecture and uploading something for it, I'm not going to count off late, right? Or, you know... You, you, you've got to go out to, you know, Vermont and handle your, your, your grandmother's estate or whatever like that for a week. I'm not going to count you off for not doing the lectures promptly. However, it's greatly to your advantage to go ahead and watch the lectures as soon as possible so you can do the homework as possible as soon as possible so you don't have late homework. If you're talking, excuse me, if you know you're going to be late, talk to me about it beforehand. You go, hey, I'm going to Vermont. I'm not going to be able to do the lectures. I might be late on doing the homework. Then I'll know, right? I might, I might be generous on the late penalties if you let me know. Now, don't come in three weeks later and say, yeah, work was really hard, so I didn't attend class, right? Let me know as soon as the problems start so that I can work with you. Attendance. Attendance will be taken every class meeting. Well, why didn't you do it today? All right. Please arrange your personal schedule. Attendance will be taken at the beginning of class. On the other hand, I don't take off for attendance. Right. So you don't need to tell me in advance that you're going to miss a day just to prevent losing some points for attendance. You don't lose points from attendance. On the other hand, I do want you to upload the, the, uh, the lecture notes, right? So you watch the videos, and we'll, we'll go into that. But you don't get taken off for attendance. But as a general rule, students who attend classes and do not miss many days perform better in the course. Incompletes. Nowadays, we're not supposed to give incompletes at all. Maybe you've heard of incompletes. Well, I made it halfway through the course, and I didn't finish it, so I got an incomplete. What we're supposed to do is give you an F, or give you the grade that you had at that point, right? Yeah, you've completed 70% of the course, but then you had to, you know, um, you know, then you had to move away and you weren't able to complete the course or whatever. No incomplete. Instead, you get that C or you get that F, but I will work with you past the end of the semester if you need to, you know, as long as you've been letting me know, you know, what's going on. And so it takes, that takes the place of the incomplete. That's just a, a, a college, you know, a business school policy. I didn't make that one up. I don't even know how to rewrite that to uh, to match that. Just know that there's no such thing as an incomplete really anymore. If you don't complete the class, you won't get a good grade in it. It'll be recorded on your on your transcript. But that if you've been talking to me about your challenges, I might let you work past the end of the semester. Attendance is mandatory in as much as if you're not here for the first week, you will be dropped from the course and AW will be recorded on your transcript. And if anybody's giving you money to go to school, they will come and get it from you. Right. Used to be that people could do a scam where they'd get grants and, you know, and then they'd go to college, but they wouldn't actually attend the classes. They just use that money and then they'd go somewhere else and repeat that. Well, it doesn't work that way anymore because the colleges and those organizations, the government, whatever, you know, cooperate to make sure that people are actually, you know, attending classes. Obviously, y'all are here, so that's not a problem for you. Just know that in the future, you always need to attend the first week of class. Now, actually, I've had somebody sh not show up for the first two weeks of class, the first three weeks of class, then get around just trying to log on, finding out they couldn't log on, send me an upset email. Well, I didn't know attendance was necessary. And I said, well, did you read the syllabus? No, I didn't read the syllabus. Did you do any of the work? No, I didn't do it. You weren't attending the class, right? Just don't do that. So what are you responsible for? 
check Canvas for updates. Having access to Canvas and MindTap or C-Engage, please read and use the required text. If you're paying a bunch of money for that thing, you may as well be using it. Keep up with the schedule. Complete your in-class and homework assignments. Turn your assignments in on time. Complete the MindTap exercises. I'm going to say quizzes, but know that MindTap calls them exams. I like the term quiz better. I wish MindTap called them quizzes. And asking for help when needed. All right. And this is just common courtesy. Please silent your stuff, right? Your phones or whatever. Don't just think that putting it on buzz is good enough. I might not hearing it buzz, might, might not hear your phone buzz, but the people, you know, on the. I've had complaints afterwards, and if I hear complaints, then I'll talk to you about it, right? Uh, getting a bunch of text messages and the phone's going bzz, bzz, the people around you may get unhappy. So. No game playing during class. No watching YouTube or Twitch streams. Don't put anything on your screen that's more interesting than I am. That's a pretty low bar, right? So the only thing you should have open on your screen is, uh, you know, Idle and maybe Google if you're looking stuff up in a textbook or, you know, the stuff that we're learning in the class. And I've had people, you know, be watching, you know, videos during class. Just pop open, you know, Twitch or whatever, and I didn't realize it until three fourths of the class, you know, and it was distracting the people behind them, but nobody complained. They didn't do well in the class. If you're doing something that requires you to minimize it as soon as I walk by, you should not have been doing it. Now, am I a jerk and I'm going to point at you and tell you not to do that? Probably not. I might mention something after class, but don't do anything you feel guilty about doing. And I know people are going to be checking their phones and stuff like that. And that's one reason I make y'all type along with me, so that you start paying attention. If I feel the need to revise the syllabus, I will upload a new version of the syllabus, and I'll post a notice of it in Canvas. Right. So it's no mystery changes. Right. You're not going to get to the end of the semester and then find out that I, I changed it so that exams are 70% of your grade. Right. I will mention it in class. A notice will be posted. And that's not going to happen anyways. What am I going to do? Provide clear instructions for assignments. If I fail in that, let me know. Don't just get to the end of the week and say I didn't understand the assignments. Or even worse, I could not find the instructions. Right. If for some reason a homework file goes missing, uh, I will always extend the deadline. Right. It's not fair for me to, you know, find the instructions, upload them on Friday, and expect you to have it done by Monday. But if you notice a problem like that, let me know as soon as possible so I can fix it for the rest of the class. And maybe it's not a problem. Maybe I just didn't explain it clearly enough. Ask me about it. I'll give you additional explanation, and then I'll probably tell the rest of the class that as well. I will answer your questions. Post in person, email, phone, or text. Person is best, of course. However, you know, we don't have a lot of time to talk during class. Sometimes we can hang out afterwards. Text messages are my preferred thing. Email, yeah, I do check email, but, you know, I may miss messages. I get, you know, approximately 7 million messages a day, just like everybody else. It's possible for me to miss them. And, of course, phone. I will give you feedback on your homework. I may just put, great job, right? If your program worked, I don't really need to write a paragraph in response. If it doesn't work, I'm going to give you some explanation of what was wrong. And then I'm going to tell you to please revise it for more credit. Because I almost always offer you that option, right? You made a 50%. I want you to fix it, right? You're not going to learn anything if you don't fix it, right? So that's why I give extra credit or, you know, I let you work towards a higher grade. I will always give you at least a week's notice of due assignments, two weeks' notice of exams. Even better than that, um, the date of your final is going to be recorded right in the syllabus, and I'll put the midterm in there as well. All right, academic integrity. This is a, a an important section, actually. I'm, I'm going to revise it. All right. Y'all aren't laughing at my jokes. It makes me feel lonely. All right, so here we go, right? Okay. Now we can scroll on to the next section. No, no, we actually have to blather about it. How do you cheat in a class like this? If you can't figure out your homework, you Google online, you find somebody else's program, and you submit it at your own. That's one way of cheating. Don't do that because I'm going to know 
that you did that. I've had people do that, right? I ask them to implement a Caesar cipher program. They go and they copy it online and they paste it and put it, they upload it, and it turns out looking like it was written by a PhD, right? And so I can kind of tell. Right? What else could you do? You could ask somebody else to work with you. Now, uh, that becomes more tempting than you might otherwise expect because if we have two people sitting next to each other, I encourage uh, you all to look at each other's screen during the class, right? So you're typing along, you have syntax errors, you're done with yours, I'm spending seven minutes back in the class, it's okay for you to be looking and go, no, I'm not going to be as good a call I'm going to be sarcastic and snarky about it. <laughs> Y'all don't have to help each other, but it helps speed the class up, right? If everybody's helping each other with the lectures. But then you become good buddies, you become friends, and you start thinking, maybe I could do my homework together. No, you got to do the homework yourself. What's another thing you could do? You could get stuck, and you could ask somebody else, just show me your code. I can't figure it out. Just let me see your code. Can I take a picture of your code? Email me your code. Nine times out of ten, if somebody asks you to email their code, they're just going to turn your code in. That's bad news. You'll get a fail on that, as well as the person who did that. If I get two identical assignments, you're both going to fail the assignment. And worse. So don't let people copy off your code. If you're going to help them, sit down with them, right? Another way to help them is just tell them to go talk to the tutor and talk to the prof, right? Nothing wrong with saying, you know, okay, all you have to do is this, you know. But don't let anybody copy your work. Don't give your work to somebody else, right? That's another way to do it. There are other ways of doing that, right? You, you go and find somebody else who took the class in the past. But I changed the homework assignment each semester. Quite often you see me create the homework assignment right on the spot at the end of the class so that it customized. So what is plagiarism? You know what plagiarism is. You download a term paper and you upload it, right? That kind of stuff. Serious consequences. Cheating, right, on your quizzes. Well, I can't prove that you took your own mind tap quiz. But the reason I have to talk about this stuff so much is that people actually do it, and I've had and it's a big pain to deal with. What have people done in the past? I've had people sit in opposite sides of the class, open up Gmail, and start trading answers with each other during the exam. That's nuts. Why would you do that? I hate having to walk around looking at the email. And I so, y'all aren't going to do that, right? Nobody's going to do that. You're not going to make me patrol you like, you know, like, you know, like y'all are spies communicating like that, right? Other things you can do. Have your camera. Take a picture. Text it to your son who knows how to do this stuff, right? Get the answer back there and don't do that. Usually I don't remember to ask students, okay, put your phones out on your desk, you know. I, I trust y'all to be grown-ups, but then every once in a while somebody betrays my trust and it really hurts my feelings. And it, uh, it also has serious, serious consequences, which we will talk about. Okay. Consequences. If I determine that you did not do your own work or you let someone else copy your work or that you collaborated on an assignment or exam, the least that will happen is you'll get an F for that assignment or exam. That's the least. Additionally, this student will be reported to the division of deans, the uh, dean division downstairs, and the director of student conduct. That seems like a bunch of rigmarole. Used to be that you would have serial cheaters. You might get away with it in one class, and so you do it in another class, and then they keep, uh, catch you. And then you'd say, you know, oh man, I'm so sorry. I just didn't know what to do. I was behind. So, you know, I will, I'll never do it again, you know, and the teacher go, okay, yeah, first strike, whatever. And it doesn't work that way anymore. The, all the reports go, you know, to one place so that, if, you know, that, that his, history is maintained. It's a real drag. You wouldn't want that on your record. You, you know, you could get kicked out of the class. You could be, you know, put on probation. You'd be kicked out of school. All because you copied something off the Internet and pasted it. Now, I'll talk about when it's appropriate to use the Internet. Because you are going to use the internet while you're writing programs. Professionals use the internet to program all the time. They use the internet more than they use textbooks, right? Anyways, okay. Bad stuff. Free personal counseling. If your life has challenges, things are interfering with your, you know, with your academic career or, or your, your success in life, 
You can go get counseling. These are good people. I've talked to them before. They're pretty awesome. It's free. What's wrong with going to talk to them, right? Free and confidential. Student support services. Used to be called the Office of Disabilities. The languages always have to change, so now it's called Student Access Services. It's located in the Learning Resource Center. I'm not sure that's the right room number anymore. Call their phone number, Google them up. One thing they'll help you do is you'll fill out a worksheet that says, you know, additional needs. Right. Ain't no big deal if you're dyslexic. I may just need to give you additional time on the homework. Right. Or I may need to give you additional time on an exam. Or I may need to allow you to sit on the front row, you know, and videotape the class or whatever. Right. Whatever you need. Now, it's really going to be easy for anybody who wants to sit on the front row, right? But if, you know, the front row is filled and you needed to sit in the front row, I would, I would facilitate that. I would ask people, you know, if somebody's going to volunteer to go to the back. Then that worksheet's given to me, and you and I have a, you know, a record that, that we create an agreement that, uh, you know, I'll work with you on it. Student email. Everybody has student email. If you can't get a hold of it, Call the IT help desk, the bookstore. You know how I get to the bookstore? I go to Google and type in Rose Bookstore. <laughs> right, I don't remember a URL. Student handbook. Looks like uh, that's the 2018 handbook. You can get to the student handbook, uh, you know, just uh, from the rose.edu website. I tried to make it easy. So I uploaded it somewhere else. Whatever. Right. Just Google up Rose Student Handbook. This is actually some important stuff. Usually people go two, two years through school without ever having read Student Handbook. I'd take time to scroll through it. You know, you're bored. You have your phone. You don't want to play, uh, you, know, um, you know, Candy Crush for an hour. You could read this. I'm kidding, but it, it's it's good information. I know it's getting boring, but we're almost at the end of the syllabus. All right, important dates for 16-week classes. Well, this is actually supposed to be the eight-week class. Like I said, I've edited this document. I will put paste our schedule. Important dates include the last day to drop with a full refund. I think that may just be the end of this week or Monday of next week. So if you decide you don't like me, you want to get a full refund, you'll need to do that. However, the last day to drop is towards the end of the semester. So, you know, if you just get into total trouble, you could drop the course. Um, you could take it again, you know, over the fall or something like that. It's not the world's worst thing to have to do that. If you decide you hate me, you could take it with another teacher. There are lots of instructors who teach this. On the other hand, you may have built up a good rapport with me and just gotten into a situation where you need a chance to take it again, right? And instead of a spring break, we have a, you know, Fourth of July break. I will update that. Same with this. This doesn't help us, right? At the last semester. I'll upload the, the revised version of this. All right, guys. We've been talking a long time. If you need a five minute break, let's go ahead and stop. All right. I forget to do this often enough. Are there any questions so far? The syllabus may have made this class sound long. Shouldn't be hard. Why do I say that? Because the third year grade is just showing up and typing in stuff with me, right? That's easy. Now, you have to put some additional effort in and understanding that, right? That's the third year grade. The exams, right? Well, part of your exam score is just the online quizzes that you get to take over and over and make under. Right? You have to put that work in. And then the homework. Yeah, you got to do the homework, but you're allowed to ask me questions, right? And I'll work with you, and uh, we can hang out after class, go down to my office or whatever, and work on our homework together. So you got to be able to do that, right? Now, it's true that some things are easier for some people than others. You know, I figured out pretty quickly that I was not going to become a professional musician, right? It was not something that I, that I had a particular talent for. But you're going to be able to do this class. Pretty much guarantee that vast, vast majority of y'all are going to be able to do the course. That's just from my prior experience. You know, people can do things that they can't, that they think they can't do. So don't be scared of the class. I try to make it fun. I try to make it interesting. 
Hopefully by the end of the class, you will have a fondness for programming. You will dig it, and even if you don't go on to use it in the future, you'll at least know more about the way computers work and the way that logic works. And, you know, it's going to make you a better user of applications, a better system administrator, or a better cybersecurity professional, whatever. Of course, you have to know the programming in order to go into the cybersecurity. You have to know scripting languages and Python and stuff like that. All right. So, why don't we modify our program to do a little bit more stuff than what it's doing now? So if you haven't closed it, well, what if I accidentally closed it? I thought the dumb old prof was tired of talking, so I closed it. Well, or what if you get a program and you download your program from, you know, from Canvas or something like that, and you need to get it to work? Now, if you go in, find your folder, find your program, you download it, whatever. If you double click on your program, it's very possible it will try to run the program. Now mine is not configured that way. But I think that's because I've changed the settings. I think that if I double clicked lecture a.py on any of these other machines, instead of launching the editor, it would run it right away. Some, somebody Prove that to me or not. Go and find your PY file. Just, you know, in Windows Explorer, double click the file and show me what it does. Yeah. All right. See, it loads up something lousy. These machines are configured to launch Windows, Python. Um, other machines are configured just to immediately launch the program in a black window and then close the window as soon as it's done. What you got to do is you got to actually edit it from within idle. Now it's possible that you know how to right click on something and do, you know, open with and then finding idle here. And if you can't find it, then you choose another app or whatever, right? Uh, the best thing to do, the easiest thing to do, unless you're, you know, a wizard or don't know how to do those things, is just to launch idle and open it from within idle, right? I'm going to have to do that because I closed my app. So I'm going to launch idle again. I'm going to do file open. Now, conveniently, if I choose recent files, it's right there, right? That saves myself a lot of time. But if it was the first time I downloaded the program, then uh, I would choose open, right? And go and find it that way. That's not such a big deal for this class, but in some classes, some programming languages like C++ or Java, it's a real pain. You can't just download the C++ file, edit, you know, double click it, and then have a working program. This is a drag that you can't do that. You have to open it up inside the, uh, the framework. You may have to create a project, import it, copy and paste it. It's a drag. At least idle, all you have to do is open it and choose open, and then you're ready to go. All right, that was the wrong one. Lecture A, that's the one I want. All right. I think I could do something else. We're displaying some stuff, but that's boring. Let's get some input. Let the user type in something. Name equals input, parentheses, in parentheses. Now, this isn't enough. I'm intentionally making a mistake. Print, parentheses, quote, Hello, end quote, comma, name. All right, now this isn't a good program, and I'll show you why. I'm going to run it. All right, well, it certainly didn't print hello. I don't know what to do. Now, as a programmer, I know that I'm supposed to type in a name because there's an input statement. I typed in a name, and it said, hello, Joe. You want to tell the user what to type. So we could put a print statement beforehand telling the user or we could put the description which is known as the prompt right here inside the input statement. What is your name? Right so now it says name equals input parentheses quote and by the way unlike some languages this one lets you use either single quotes or double quotes as long as you you know close it with the same one. I like double quotes because that's how other languages do it. 
double quote, what is your name, question mark, end quote, in parentheses, and then print, parentheses, quote, hello, in parentheses, common name. All right, now it's ready to go. All right, what is your name? At least it told me what I'm supposed to do there. Now, just some stylistic points. If I had not had that question mark there, then when I ran it, and it says, what is your name? Yeah, I kind of know where to type it, but it looks tacky, and my name is right and crammed right up next to it. So you can spend some time to make these things look better, like what is your name, and then, you know, a space or two. I've gotten real fond recently of putting a little greater than sign before the end quote to let the user know exactly where they're supposed to type. Right? There. Kind of looks old-fashioned, right? But lets the user know where they're supposed to type. Mm. All right, we're going to do a little bit more. Then we're going to talk about what we're seeing here in our code. All right, now we're going to ask for their age. And the code that follows is going to look a little bit complicated this first time, but I don't mind showing you all some complicated stuff and then going back to lecture more about it. Why do I do that? Because the first time you see it, you know, 10% of it will lodge in your head, and then we hit it in the, in the official lecture, and, you know, the other 80% lodges, you know, and then you, we do it again, and 100% of it sticks. I never mind giving you all sneak previews. Spoilers. So, age equals input, parentheses, quote, what is your age, question mark. What is your age, question mark, space, space, greater than, end quote, in parentheses. Unfortunately, what they type in it's just typewriter characters that have to be converted to a number that the computer can understand. So we're going to do that. We're going to ask the user for a number. Excuse me. We've asked them, but now we need to convert it to a number. Like if we wanted to do math to it. Because until we convert it to a number, it's just typewriter characters. So age equals int parentheses age in parentheses. And by the way, sometimes when I'm writing these things, you'll see me add extra spaces in various places, trying to make it easy. I haven't been doing that while I'm going. You certainly don't have to be making these changes as I do it now. But are the spaces important? No. Right. So if you're seeing me add spaces and you're wondering why I'm adding spaces, often it's just to try to make it easier for you to, to read so that you make fewer syntax errors while typing. All right. Don't need to do that. All right. We have a number. Let's do something else with that. We're going to print the word happy birthday as many years, as many times as we type in our age. Like if we type in that we're 19, it's going to print happy birthday 19 times in a row. That's kind of silly, but whatever. All right. So this syntax is going to be very specific and very picky. Not as picky as it is in some languages, but okay. So for nat 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 nat. Let's do x equals one on one line. On the next line, we're gonna say while x less than, which is a shift comma, equal, don't put a space between the less than and the equal sign, 10 colon. Now that colon is necessary, and when you hit enter, it's going to be tabbed over. That tab is very, very, very important. Oh, by the way, there's options, configure. You can make your font larger. I know nowadays that uh, everybody has these small laptops, you know, with a 4,000 by 5,000 resolution. You can see that, but I can't. So you can always increase your font size. Another thing you can do is you notice that while we're typing stuff, it gets colorized. It's called syntax coloring or syntax highlighting. Maybe you hate the color orange. 
maybe you wanted that to be red. Well, you can choose highlights, find the orange part, and change it to red. All right, I'm not actually seeing how to change the color, but we could, I'm sure we can. Yeah, just like that. Okay. Or there are entire themes. Idle dark, right? Okay, just showing you that. It's always a good idea to explore your tools. Can we close this window without that button being visible? Okay, fine. All right, so back to here. I type in that call and I hit enter. It's tabbed over. Now, in some languages, the tabbing doesn't matter. In this language, it's incredibly important. If you don't get your tabs correct, it doesn't run. That's one of the quirks of Python. In many, many ways, writing Python code is easier than everything else. But in this one, the tabs are incredibly important. It's one of the few quirks that makes it kind of, it, it becomes second nature, though. And it tries to help you, right? But if, it, if I hit Enter and it wasn't tabbed, I would hit the tab key. All right. Print, parentheses. Quote, happy birthday, exclamation mark, end quote, comma, X, parentheses. And I realize that this looks like advanced calculus or, or, or Greek or something to you know, some of y'all, and that's okay. Like I said, I don't mind showing y'all things in advance, giving you sneak previews. All right, if I run it, what is your name? Jeff, hello Jeff, what is your age? Well, I'm nine, and I made a mistake, right? Now there's no syntax errors on this, so if you uploaded this to me as part of your homework, I'd give you some credit for it, right? At least it ran. It didn't do the right thing, so you're not gonna get 100 on it. And it might be a 50, or if it's a long, you know, you got a majority of the code, might be a 70 or something like that, okay. I didn't, forgot to add a line of code, and I did not do this intentionally, but you think I would learn. X space equals space X plus 1. Now you could take out all those spaces and it would work just as well. Alright, what is your name? Jeff. What is your age? 10. And then it printed out happy birthday and it printed it out 10 times. All right. I think we're actually just about done for today. We're going to end a little bit early just for today. We'll never do that again. We'll always use up our max time. I want to give ourselves time to talk afterwards if people need to talk after class or, you know, we can go get some coffee early or something like that. Everybody get this working. You got syntax errors, it won't take you. Get the time, wave your hand, and you can stop. If they don't pay attention to me, throw a shoe at me, I'll start.
my notes. Notice I added a one more line. You don't have to take screenshots for the lectures, but I want you to do it just this one time so you know how to do it for the homework, right? If you know how to do a screenshot, great. You know, space out for a few minutes. If you don't, even if you're not done, doesn't matter, right? Get everything the way you want it on the screen. You know, smile, take a pretty picture. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to try to put my code, you know, and my, you know, output. Whatever. Right. Now I'm ready for the screenshot. So I hit the print screen button. No one knows what that sysrec function underneath it means. All right. So anyways, and when I say that, if you Google it up, you'll see that I'm, I'm correct in that statement. I'm sorry. Pardon me. The print screen button in this case is above numlock. Oh, it's and scroll lock is another interesting one that nobody knows how to use. So, anyways, click print screen. Open up Word or open up Paint. Open up your favorite painting program. And then just paste. Right. I always use keyboard combos, so I would type Control V. You may ask yourself why V means paste. A control V as in vehicle, paste your picture, and then just save it, right? Doesn't matter what format, PNGs are great. If you saved it as a Word doc, great, save it as a Word doc. And put it into the same folder as your uh, as your other work. And give it a good name, like uh, Lecture A, or even Lecture A screenshot, if you like it. Those are the two files I'm going to want you to upload, lectureA.py and lectureA.screenshot. Now, some people like to get all fancy and make zip files that contain those things. You don't have to make zip files. You know, know how to make a zip file? Great. If you like making zip files and you want to submit it as a zip file, that's fine, but it, it, it doesn't make grading it any easier, so you don't have to do it. So lastly, we're going to need to upload. And if you did not type in any code during the lecture, just, up, just create a file saying that you were here, right? Create the file in idle or notepad or word or something, because that, that proves that you were here, right? So I like having a file there. You get credit even for uploading just a document saying that you were here. Doesn't work that way for homework. Right? Okay. So, I need to submit into that folder. So, I'm going to click on Assignments. I'm going to click on A, first program. Today is A. All right, Submit Assignment. I need to upload something, choose file, and give me those two files. You can do them one at a time or you can shift click, right? What do I mean by that? You select one, shift click, select the other. No, it's not letting me shift click. I have to do it one at a time. What do you know? And it doesn't take any time. Now, there's this comments field. You don't have to add a comment. If your code does not work and you're submitting it anyways, to make a deadline or something, I'll feel a lot better about it if you put a comment in there saying that it doesn't work. If I open the code and it doesn't work, if it gets a syntax error and you did not give me that warning, it, it hurts my feelings. You'll get a better grade. You may at least get a, you know, some points if you add some comment, right? 
got his index error on the loop. Please help. Now, what was the real thing you should have done? Taken a picture of your code, texted it to me, and I would have helped you do it right. But you can put a comment there. Or, sorry, this was late. You know, <laughs> my grandmother was in the hospital. Whatever. Again, it would be nice if you had told me in advance of it being late. But anyways, use the comments field judiciously. Or just, this was amazingly fun. I learned so much. Whatever you want to put there. Okay, click Submit. And you're done. Now, since I'm in student mode, I didn't get to see the results. All right. Eventually, like, uh, I will always grade things within a week. You'll get some feedback on it. If I wanted you to fix it, then, you know, then you'll read that feedback and you'll get, and you'll go and fix it. So everybody get all of that. Get the file uploaded. Oh, why did I put 10 there? Did I put 10 there in my code? Yeah. What should I put there? Somebody who uh, has an idea of what I was trying to make it do, which is to loop until it hit the age. Yeah, it should have been age. You don't have to fix it, but it would be nice if instead of saying while well, X is less than 10, it said X is less than age. So if you typed in 30, or if you typed in 8, it ought to print it out 8 times or 30 times. Now you don't have to go and update, you re-upload and take a new screenshot or whatever. But I do want this to be correct, you know, in, in the daily notes. So I'm making the change. Yeah, you're already good, right? Your lectures, it doesn't matter if there's a syntax error or not, right? The lectures are just so that you can type in some notes to encourage you to take notes and to keep you engaged. And I think that most people learn better if they get, you know, the code in front of them working rather than just by, you know, trying to stay awake looking at the screen. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, there we go. Now it works better. I can't believe I didn't notice that. See, I did that on purpose just to see who would catch it, if you believe that. Okay. All right, again, homework. Oh, man, you're already giving me homework. Um, not a big deal. It's just to install Python. Notice it is called homework assignment zero. There's a reason why I called it zero rather than one, which is that computers tend to start counting at zero. We will find places where the computer's counting, and they always start counting at zero, called zero-based indexing. That's just to try to remind you. Plus, you know, it's not very hard homework. So, where's the homework discussed? Well, it will eventually be uh, tacked on to the first homework assignment page. When I did my import, it did not attach these things to that. I will go ahead and do that. But if you can't find the homework assignment attached to the assignment folder, you're going to look in modules, homework instructions. Now it'll be in the right place pretty soon. Homework zero, install Python. Right? And here's the instructions. Go to python.org, select, download. See what I mean by the uh, preview mode being annoying? I always download these things. Download and install, launch idle, take a screenshot. You don't even have to write a program. On Windows, there are many ways to do it. Here's how I do it. Mac and Linux users, Google how to do it, because I can't tell you how. I can. I'm a Mac user, but I'm not a Linux user. And then submit your files. In this case, it's just one file. It's just a screenshot, right? So that'll be your homework assignment. Please get Python installed by Sunday. But I'm not going to install Python. You said that I could do it online, and I could do it in OK, just create a document saying that you're going to be doing your homework at school, right? Or you're going to be doing it you know, with an online. Do upload something, or else you don't get any credit for that, right? But if you tell me one thing or the other, yeah, I installed Idle, and here's my screenshot, or you, uh, you know, upload a Word document, or you know, whatever. 
letting me know how you're going to get your homework done, even though you didn't install Python, then we'll be good. You've got 100 on it. All righty. Let's call ourselves done. <laughs>